This looks so complicated, but I'm going to leave it. Okay, uh, hello everybody. Welcome to this workshop series. I guess it's a series. It's got two lectures. I'm not sure what the definition of a series is, but I figure two things in sequence is a series. So what I am going to cover is um, observational studies, observational clinical studies. What that means in terms of biostatistics is uh, multivariable modelling. I'm going to cover the two lectures. Today I'm going to focus on continuous outcomes, so something measured on a continuous scale, and the workshop in a fortnight I'm going to cover binary variables. If you are interested in me doing extra workshops, we might do time to event variables like survival outcomes, things like that, just let me know. I'm very happy to actually run these types of workshops. We just thought we'd start off with these two and see how people went. Okay. So, uh, just a little tiny bit about what we're going to cover today. I'm going to give you some background. I really do want to couch this stuff in terms of the clinical sciences, in terms of the reason you do this stuff. Uh, okay, because when you go back to the dark days of undergraduate and you covered these things, a lot of the time you probably didn't appreciate where they actually fit, why you do this. People find biostats uh, dry. They do, I admit it. I mean, I've come to terms with that. Um, but I find if they understand why they're doing it, people actually sometimes will admit to themselves and even to me that they actually like it. They don't mind it at all. Once I've worked out why you use it, and it really is to address our research questions. So it's a very useful set of tools. So I'm gonna give you some background. I'm gonna talk about why we need multivariable modeling. I'm gonna talk about how this might relate to the research objective. How does our research question relate to our modeling strategy? And then I'm going to start to introduce the actual biostatistical models we're going to cover today, which is linear regression and its children. Okay, and its children are actually a little bit more important to us than linear regression itself. So before we can cover the more useful methods of the general linear model, I do need to talk about linear regression itself. Okay. Once we've covered this idea of a general linear model, I also want to bring it back to the clinical epidemiology side of things. So again, how we use these to do clinical research. So I'm going to talk about the various role that other predictor variables can have. It may not be the predictor we are interested in, but we still need to account for them, deal with them. So I'm going to talk about things like confounding and effect modification. And I'm going to end off uh, with that. Okay, so the rationale for multivariable modeling in the first place is we know in experimental studies and specifically in randomized controlled trials, we have the ability to design out problems. So by the design we use, we can take out many of the biases that work their way into clinical studies. We can randomize participants, this balances confounders. We can also do things like blinding, where patients don't know which treatment group they're in, or the investigators or uh, evaluators don't know which research, uh, sorry, which treatment group patients are in. So we can take biases out of our study. Now, these might be real biases or perceived biases. So if a reviewer is reading your work, they want to know you were blinded so you couldn't uh, somehow impose bias in there, even if you wouldn't do that. Okay, the good news is, is when we do these types of studies, the statistical methods, if we're talking about standard RCTs, are pedestrian. We can get away with t-tests because all of the complexity is in the design and we can use a really simple statistical text to actually demonstrate the efficacy of a treatment or intervention. Okay. Um, also, because the problem has been designed to a very specific question, we've taken out variables like confounders and so on, we can also, so it's sufficiently simple in other words, we can also power the study. We can calculate a sample size, 
that is associated with a, identifying a particular minimal clinical difference, okay? Now, what people don't seem to understand is as soon as you move away from this very simple situation, our ability to power studies or calculate sample sizes becomes a guess. And I mean, sometimes it is a crazy and rank guess that we are making. And a lot of time we'll put some Greek letters in to make it seem scientific. Uh, and that's very important people understand that, okay? The upshot of experimental studies, and in particular randomized controlled trials, is uh, that the results have very perceived high scientific quality. What that means is if we do an RCT, if we do it well, readers and reviewers and all of those people that seem to matter to us believe us. That's it. It's as simple as that. When we have an observational study, we have to try very hard to convince people that our work is believable, that it's credible. Okay, so really this should make it clear that RCTs and other types of clinical trials, if they're so good, why don't we do them all of the time? The answer is pretty simple. And probably number one is often they are unethical. In many epidemiological studies, we're interested in risk factors. We cannot impose a protocol of risky behavior on people. I'd love to get half of you to take up smoking so I could see its effect in 20 years on your health, but it's not a very nice thing to do, is it? And no ethics committee in the world is actually going to let me do that. So in many cases, we just can't do experiments because it's not ethical to do so. And particularly if it's about risk and many epidemiological studies are about risk factors, not necessarily about the benefits of a treatment. Feasibility is the second reason. RCTs, particular, particularly randomized control trials, are extremely expensive. Um, and for their results to be truly valid, we really want them to be multi-center as well. And that means they've got to be bigger even again because there are issues in multi-center studies. And we just don't have the resources, whether that be money or time because RCTs have to be prospective studies. You can't do a retrospective RCTs, there's no such thing. And also applicability. This is the last issue. Um, the settings for RCTs are often artificial. They are best case scenario. We tend to monitor patients very carefully. We hassle patients to comply to our protocols and so on. In reality, when we deploy a new treatment, we often can't do this. So many RCTs are about efficacy rather than effectiveness. What will happen in the real world once we deploy this treatment? Okay, so I guess the point I'm making here is we would love to do RCTs for everything. They have very strong evidence. Statistically, they're very simple, mostly. They're very simple to deal with, uh, but it either just doesn't work or it's not a good option. So what do we do? Given the difficulties uh, and issues in conducting RCTs, we are often left to observational study designs. So given the limited ability for a researcher to intervene in observational studies, remember, in an observational studies, we are just sitting back and watching people. In an experimental study, we're God. We are intervening. We are making patients do things. Okay, in observational studies, we're not. We're from the outside looking in. Um, so we have a limited ability to intervene uh, in observational studies. So for this reason, they are much more susceptible to bias. We can't control things. Things just happen how they happen. And our only recourse is to model out these sorts of problems. So in experimental studies, we can design them out through our study design. We can take out these problems. In observational studies, we can only model them out. We can use statistical trickery, in other words, to actually try and get results 
that are comparable to that we would see in an experimental study. The upshot for you, what's important for you, is that we have to leave the simple classical statistical methods like t-tests, like chi-square tests behind, and we have to use uh, statistical modeling, which can get a little bit tricky. It's not as bad as people think once you're used to it, um, but we do. We have to consider multivariable models. Also, just while I'm here, I'd probably like to underline this idea of bias that we can really think of as an alternative explanation for the results we observe. So if it's confounding bias, we might have more males in this group than that group, and that might interfere with our study effect. Okay, so I'm sure you've all seen a table like this before. Um, and this is primary data studies that we see in the clinical sciences. And the ones in blue are the experimental studies, which I'm not really going to talk about today. And the ones in green are the ones we are concerned about in today and the fortnight's talk. Cohort studies, cross-sectional studies, case control studies, and not many of you would do ecological studies. Uh, that's much more, say, for environmental epidemiology, like dengue and malaria and those types of diseases. Uh, most of you will be doing cohort cross-sectional case control studies. Okay, so I'm not actually going to go into much detail about these, those different types of study designs because it's not an epidemiology lecture. I want to really focus much more on statistical methods. But before I get into the main method we're going to talk about today, I also want to talk about how our research question, not just our design, but our research question or research objective might relate to our analytical approach. So how we might model and what represents a good model. And I've never actually seen this written anywhere. I guess I've just seen many, 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 many studies and maybe it is written down and it might be called something else. But in my experience, studies in the clinical sciences tend to fall into three main areas. Uh, and by the way, when I say clinical sciences, I'm, I, I should also include community-based and population-based health studies as well. Um, so basically, exploratory studies, hypothesis testing studies, and predictive studies. Okay, and I guess why I like to separate these is how we evaluate how good a model is might be different based on these three types of objectives. And I'm going to go through each of them. Okay, so we should emphasize different aspects of our models for these different types of studies. Now, let me go through each. Is that me? Okay. Doesn't sound like me. Okay, so exploratory studies, I like to think of uh, as the what are studies. So for example, what are the important risk factors for type 2 diabetes uh, among Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander adults? All we want to do is identify the risk factor. We're not even that worried about the exact number, like an odds ratio or so on. It's more that this is risky, this isn't, okay? That's the main emphasis. Yes, we want that number, but the number isn't the main objective. What are the important biomarkers out of a panel of biomarkers for patient prognosis or diagnosis? Okay, so we might have a bunch of potentially important variables and we want to identify a smaller subset or panel or whatever of those variables that are important that we might further investigate in subsequent studies, okay? Now, the point is, is in these types of studies, we really want to demonstrate statistical significance. So therefore, our peers less than 0 0.05. Um, because in other words, we want to say, we didn't just dream it, this is probably a risk factor. And if we repeated the study over and over and over again, it's probably going to turn out to be a risk factor in those studies as well. That's what a p-value will tell you. 
Okay, it doesn't say whether something's clinically important necessarily. Uh, that can be a somewhat arbitrary. Okay, so p-values are sort of important to us in this type of study, but we're not really concerned with model fit. We are not trying to explain 90% of variation in the data. That's for other types of studies. So it's very much a yes, no type of study. And those numbers, we do want to see them because they give us an estimate of how important something is. But we're not really interested in model fit, that it fits very tightly to the data. And we're not gonna deploy anything to the shop floor from this type of study. So if we're doing a diagnostic test, we really wanna say, this works really well for the diagnosis of disease X, Y, Z. We should use it from now on, okay? That's not what we're doing here. Hypothesis testing studies. Now, this actually captures probably a majority of studies I do. A hypothesis testing study, the thing that makes them jump out, and again, people don't spot this. The thing that makes them jump out is that they have a single study effect. That is one predictor that is of much more scientific interest than all of the other predictors we have. Okay, so these studies include a large majority of randomized control trials. Why? Because we want to see the efficacy of a particular drug or treatment or intervention. And everything else doesn't really matter to us. We just want to be able to say, don't worry about that stuff. The drug works. Okay, so we have our outcome, might be blood sugar control, and we have our predictor, which is, were you on the treatment or not? The predictor is of central importance. Other covariates don't really matter to us, not scientifically anyway. We might have to adjust for them, but they don't. There are also many observational studies, particularly in epidemiology, uh, that they, they include many covariates, but the research question focuses on a single predictor. What is the effect of BMI on developing hypertension, for example? Now, the focus there is on BMI, even though we know there's gonna be a lot of other covariates involved in the study. Basically, the easy way of spotting a hypothesis testing study is the study effect is almost always mentioned in the title of the study. So for example, a potential title for a study might be the impact of smoking on the development of retinopathy among type two diabetes patients, a prospective cohort study. Right there, in the middle of the title is the study effect. Okay, it might be an observational study. There might be 30 other covariates in the study, but what we care about, what the paper is about, is the impact of smoking. Okay, and all, uh, almost all RCTs are these types of studies. Okay, the final one is predictive studies. And this is usually where we have some sort of evidence for things being prognostic or diagnostic or risk factors, if it's just a risk scoring study. We, we have evidence of this sort of stuff. So we're sort of more informed when we build our panel of predictors, okay? And the idea here is that we want to come up with a product, a rule that says you are likely to have the disease or not, that's a diagnostic study, you're likely to get the disease or not, that's a type of prognostic study, and so on. Here, the focus is on the particular patient, a patient sitting in front of us, and we wanna say, yes, you've got the disease, no, you don't, and we're pretty certain you have the disease, or we're pretty certain that you don't, okay? Um, and yeah, as I've said, in the clinical sciences, the most common predictive studies are diagnostic and <laughs> prognostic studies. Now here, again, it's not necessarily about p-values. It's actually about the accuracy of the tool itself. So in a diagnostic study or some prognostic studies, the emphasis will be think on things like sensitivity and specificity and positive and negative predictive values. It's much less about the statistical significance of the model. Now you could argue that these are measures of model fit. 
that if a model is very sensitive, it can identify people who do have the disease. Specific, it can identify people who don't have the disease, then it actually fits the data well. Okay, so model fit is very, very important in predictive studies. Not so much p-values. You've got to have them there because if something's not significant, we can't say that it's going to work on another sample or in the population in general, but it's of secondary importance. It's a tick in the box. Okay. Okay, so just a final point about the types of studies and peer review. And this is a comment I've just had, it's almost frustration that I, I have all the time. Although there are differences in how we should sell the strengths of the various types of studies, so we talk about exploratory studies, hypothesis studies, and predictive studies, we still need to take care because not all reviewers will have a strong understanding of this. I have had some comments from reviewers that just seem crazy to me. They are absolutely crazy and editors have to believe the reviewer because they don't have the time to go and read the paper and say, oh, that reviewer doesn't know what they're talking about. Uh, and I think this is, I don't know what it is. It might be a shortage of methodologists in general. Uh, so in an ideal world, we'd have clinical reviewers and we'd have methodological reviewers. And I think methodological reviewers are just so scarce. Uh, we often rely on a clinical expert to make a methodological assessment of a study. And sometimes this can cause problems because there is an assumption that a clinical expert is also a methodological expert. In many cases, this is true because that clinical expert has done a lot of research, but in a lot of cases, it doesn't follow that someone who has a strong in a particular clinical science is also strong in their methodology. And what I find one of the most common problems is, is that they are strong in a particular area and they will bring those comments across. The perfect example I think I can find of this is human research ethics committees and animal research ethics committees. In animal research ethics committees, we kill the animal. So there's a very different emphasis on minimizing the number of individual animals in the study. It's not necessarily about power of the study. So you have a lot of my studies that will have six mice. It's in highly controlled conditions, but some clinical people are starting to make their way onto these animal research ethics committees and they're saying, where's your sample size calculation? So they're going to need 30 mice where really they needed six before. It's just we can see this sort of creepage into these different areas and it potentially causes problems, that's all. And it's not, uh, you know, I don't mean anything insulting to people in these areas. We just have our different expertise and we sort of should remember our own limitations. I wouldn't give advice to a patient on anything. I've done a lot of clinical research, but I'm not gonna advise patients on anything. Um, okay, how do we get around this problem? Anybody got an answer? I, there's an answer written there, but has anyone come across this problem? You must have. We write defensively. That's how. Sometimes it's impossible to write defensively, but let me give you an example, okay? Uh, if it was a protocol, I'm not talking about a paper, I would say as this is a retrospective cohort study, it would be inappropriate to power the study because we lack the knowledge uh, of what would go into such a calculation, number one. No such formula exists, number two. And three, our sample size is fixed. It's based on the last three years of data. I can't change the sample size even if I had a choice. Okay, so just pointing out those sorts of things can help. And that's where defensive writing can help. It stops reviewers or assessors going down paths they probably shouldn't. Okay, so now let's get to the modeling side. Um, I'm going to focus today on the analysis of continuous and normal outcomes. 
specifically, we're going to cover linear regression and the general linear model, which is a much more useful form of linear regression. In the next session, as I've already mentioned, I'm going to cover binary and logistic regression, which personally I enjoy teaching much more than the general linear model. So if you get bored today, next fortnight's going to be very exciting. Okay, uh, so collectively, these two models and their extensions, so the mixed models and, all, and so on, really do represent a majority of analysis that you would have to do. Okay, they do. Like, I, I would say probably, I don't know, I don't know about you, Alison, probably 80% of analyses I do involve either a continuous or a binary outcome. Okay, I know there's survival analysis and uh, multi-category outcomes, but that, they just don't come up as much. Just a quick note that not all continuous outcomes are normal. So continuous is not a synonym for normal. Okay, just to give you an example of one that's not, concentrations. If you're looking at blood concentrations of something, for example, uh, it will often not have an, a normal distribution. It's going to be zero bound. You can't have negative concentrations of something and often it will have a distribution that looks like that. So it might be an exponential or a gamma distribution and there are special methods for that. That's continuous, but not normal, all right? So just be careful. A, a majority of outcomes that you'll come across will be normal, but it, particularly if you work in specific areas, uh, you'll use these weird models that have these different types of outcomes. Okay, so the one thing I would like to point out about linear regression is it does represent life, the universe, and everything. It really does. Because even with highly, highly advanced models, if you dig deep enough, right down the bottom, there's going to be a linear regression model. And to be more general, I would just call it a linear model. That's what it is. Everything or a large majority of stuff in biostatistics in particular has been extended from a standard linear regression model. That includes the general linear model, which we're going to cover today, generalized linear models like logistic regression, close on regression. We're going to cover logistic regression in a fortnight. Survival, so time to event models, so proportional hazards regression, Cox regression, that has a linear regression underneath. And all of these longitudinal models, so linear mixed models, generalized estimated equation, generalized linear mixed models, so on, all of them have a linear regression down the bottom. So what I'm trying to say to you here is understanding linear regression is sort of important if you want to understand biostatistics. Okay, so that's it. If we want to understand these advanced methods, we should probably understand linear regression. And it's not hard. It's not really hard. It's quite sensible, really. Okay, just for, to remind you what I mean by the word model, I just mean a mathematical representation and simplification of a system under study. And for us, that's going to be the relationship between clinical variables in patient populations. Okay, so here it is. We have our first simple linear regression. And I know for most of you, this should be revision, but I'm hoping you're seeing it with fresh eyes now. We have a simple linear regression, we have a single predictor, and a simple outcome. We have a multivariable linear regression where we have multiple predictors for a single outcome. So a simple linear regression means one explanatory variable, that's where we get the word simple from, related to a response variable or a dependent variable or an outcome variable in a linear way, okay? What do I mean by linear? It doesn't matter where you are on the line, the XY relationship stays the same, as opposed to nonlinear where the XY relationship might get more profound as we move along, or less profound as we move along, and so on. Okay, the trick to linear regression modeling, and I'm talking about the sort of classical approach here, is that we follow steps, okay? And really, 
following recipes is the way, particularly when you're getting used to statistical modeling, it really is the way to go. It's a much simpler way of doing things because it seems confusing to you at first. So the first thing we do is we estimate the model. Now I'm gonna come back to that and talk about this. We estimate the model, we ask the question, we've estimated, but is it a good model? Yes or no? If it is good enough, how good is it? And so on. So we assess the model adequacy, goodness, if you like. And then in some studies, if it's the right type of study, specifically a predictive study, if our model is super duper, we can then go and use it to make predictions, okay? In a lot of health studies, it's not good enough. And that's not our objective anyway. Usually, because we know it's not gonna be good enough. Okay, so let's consider a motivating example here. We're gonna consider, very boring by the way, uh, systolic blood pressure in adults. And just note, it's an adult population. So it's 17 to 69 years old. And our research question is, can systolic blood pressure be explained by somebody's age? In other words, is age a predictor of somebody's systolic blood pressure? Now, which of those three types of studies do you think this is? Exploratory, hypothesis testing, or predictive? Which one? Okay, let me, let me reset. The title of my paper is The Role of Age in Blood Pressure or Hypertension or something like that. I've mentioned the study effect in the title of the paper it's most likely a hypothesis testing study because I have a predictor of interest. There may be a bunch of predictors in the study, but I have a predictor of interest, okay? So is age a risk factor for uh, high or low or whatever blood pressure? Okay, so, and this is actually a very important step, particularly with continuous data, that people seem to forget it might be the SPSS world that allows us to do a quite advanced analysis by just going boop and pressing a button. But very few people, or a lot of people don't, eyeball the data, okay? It's a very good idea to eyeball the data because it gives you a feel for what's going on. What's going on here? Generally speaking, we can see that people's systolic blood pressure seems to go up as their age increases. And it seems to occur in about a linear way. It looks like I can see a line through there. I don't know about that. I'd probably go and have a look at them and see if they were a member of our clinical population. They might be just strange for some reason. It might be an error or whatever. But the fact is, is eyeball the data. It gives you a feel for how the statistics relates to the research problem, okay? You want this to be intuitive, at least for you. Okay, so I've just run this through R and it will spit out my regression analysis, which I'm gonna come back to later. Okay, so there it is. Um, okay, so going through these steps I mentioned here, okay? Number one, estimate the equation, okay? By the way, we don't do that, the computer does that. Two, is it a good model? How good is it? And three, if it's a super duper model, use it to make predictions. Okay, so we just estimated our model. There it is, y equals b0 plus b1x. And notice I'm using b rather than beta because this is the sample values. It's the estimates. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is from here, I'm gonna get the intercept and I'm gonna get the slope and I'm going to plug it into that equation. There we go. There's the magic rule that will allow me to predict your systolic blood pressure as long as you are willing to disclose your age to me, okay? And, and just note that general rule that Latin letters are used for sample values or sample estimates, 
and Greek letters for the population values. Okay, so how did R or Stata or SAS or the other one estimate our line? It basically fit the line through the bar such that it minimized the sums of the squared values. Okay, I should say the squared errors. So we want to fit that line through these data points such that the sum of these red squares is as small as possible. That's called minimizing the sums of squares or the principle of least squares. Makes a lot of sense, really. Okay, that's how R did it. R, in this case, does it really matter to you? Not a hell of a lot. Not unless you want to really give it a lot of thought. Okay, that's just how it does it. So that was our step one. Okay, the software did all the work for us. It estimated the model and it used the principle of least squares because that's what linear regression does. Okay, so how do we interpret these magic numbers? Well, B to zero is what we call the y-intercept, and it will be the value, generically, it's the value of our outcome variable when our predictor equals zero. In this context, systolic blood pressure will be what if you are a newborn baby? Setting that to zero, 98. The other one, the slope, represents the change in y every time we increase x by one. Sorry, I've got to do it for you. Every time we increase x by one. So as I get one year older, we would expect on average my systolic blood pressure to change by what? Oops, wrong way it's going to be about 0 0.97, okay? So because we have these two parameters, potentially we have two hypotheses, okay? The first hypothesis, now remember in the hypothesis we always use the Greek letters, we're always trying to hypothesize about the population, not the sample, we know about the sample. So B to 0 equals 0. Against an alternative of zero does not equal zero. Now let's spell this out in words to see what a ridiculous hypothesis this actually is. In words, the systolic blood pressure on average in newborn babies is zero. HA, systolic blood pressure in newborn babies on average is not zero. Should I even answer that question? No. It's a ridiculous question to pose. One, it's not true, not even close to true. Two, we don't have babies in our sample. We are not making statements about newborn babies at all. We are making statements about adults, okay? So it's not relevant, it's not even sensible, okay? And it certainly doesn't relate to our research question at all. So what do we do? We've got two choices. We can ignore this hypothesis, but leave B to zero in the model, or we can ignore the hypothesis and take B to zero out of the model. Which of those two options should we do? And I want you to look at that line. We should not ask the question, so not address the hypothesis, but we still need to leave B to zero in the model because it makes the model fit the data. If I force this line through zero, it's going to be terrible. Okay, so B to zero is still, we still want it because it makes the model better, but we don't really want to use it for testing any hypotheses or answering any research questions. Okay, so we need it. It's there for convenience. The much more interesting and relevant hypothesis to test would be about the slope. The slope equals zero under HO against an alternative that it differs significantly from zero. In words, 
age does not linearly explain variation in systolic blood pressure against uh, the alternative age does linearly explain variation in systolic blood pressure. Now, just going to our output and different software will present it in different ways. Probably in R, just use the stars. That means P is less than 0 0.001. And we can see that this is significantly different from zero. What does it mean? Yes, age is a predictor of systolic blood pressure and it's positively associated with it as well. So as age goes up, so does systolic blood pressure by about one unit for every uh, year older you get. Okay, so we have fit our model. We've started our step two and said, is the model good enough to proceed? Yes, it is, because we can see our predictor is a significant predictor. Now we actually want to see, uh, well, it's good enough, but how good is it? Okay, in linear regression, probably the most common measure used is called R squared. It's full and horrible and quite meaningless name is the coefficient of determination, okay? Call it R squared. Everyone calls it R squared. And it literally is Pearson's correlation coefficient squared. That's why it's called R squared. What does it represent? It represents the percentage or proportion, depending on the software, the percentage of variation in Y explained by variation in X. Okay, so if we look at our output, it is spit out around here. And we can see that our R squared was 43.2. What does that mean? About 43% of variation in systolic blood pressure can be explained by your age. Is that good or bad? or an inappropriate question. It depends on your field, okay? If I was doing laboratory studies on mice, that is a terrible R squared. If I'm doing a, a community-based study, that's actually not bad at all. 43%, almost half of someone's variation in their blood pressure can be explained by one effect, one predictor, that's not bad at all. So I can't give you a magic cutoff as to what is good or bad. You really do need to consider what type of study it actually is. 43% for a single predictor is not bad. Okay, the last step in is it a good model? So we've said, yes, it's good enough. We've looked at the R squared and given that this was just a, a sample of people, it's like a community-based study, 43% is okay. But is it, the, is it an appropriate model to fit? Do all of the model assumptions, are they met? Does it actually work? In linear regression, and this might seem complicated to you at first, but it's actually quite sensible. We also need to consider the assumptions that the model makes before we fit it. First, that if there's a relationship between y and x, it is a linear relationship. In other words, a straight line model will actually work. All right, that's fair enough. Number two, the y's are serially independent. That means my value of systolic blood pressure has nothing to do with yours which probably isn't true at the moment, you're sitting in a biostatistics lecture, okay? We're not independent of each other at this point in time, but if this was a community-based study, it's probably pretty safe. Where is this violated repeated measure studies? Obviously, my blood pressure today is related with my blood pressure yesterday, okay? So that's really something we can assess purely on study design. And the third, and this is going to seem complicated, but it's also very quite, it's really quite simple, is that what is left after we explain the part of why that we can explain, after we can, can explain the part of systolic blood pressure that age explains, what's left is random normal. That, that's the main point and that it doesn't bias in any particular direction. 
Okay, I'm not actually going to go into those in any great detail. If anybody has questions about them, please let me know. I sort of had to keep it down to around 60 slides, and that takes up about four or five just talking about it. Okay, really, we want to know is this mathematical form of representing this relationship appropriate? That's what we're addressing with our assumptions. Okay, finally, step three is prediction. Now remember, only if it's a very good model would we consider prediction. But before we even talk about that, I want to talk about the, uh, the notion of interpolation and extrapolation. Okay, let's assume for the sake of argument that this was a super duper model, really good. Okay, could I then predict what systolic blood pressure was for uh, someone who's 50? Yes, I can. I just plug it into the model. And that's going to give me the estimate of someone's systolic blood pressure when they're 50 years old. That's called interpolation. Now, interpolation, remember, 17 years old to 69 years old. That was our sample. 50 years old is in the middle there somewhere. That's perfectly okay to do. 18 year olds, fine. 68 year, uh, sorry, was it 69? It was 69. 68 year olds, fine. For a five year old child, no, it is not fine. They are not part of our population. They weren't included in the sample. That's extrapolation and we cannot use linear regression for that purpose. Nor should we with an 85 year old. We can only assume that it is linear and that our model holds within the data we have. We don't know what it does down here or what it does up there, okay? Finally, this point is moot because I wouldn't use this model for prediction anyway because I would be way off. It's only 43.2% of variation that can be explained. Okay, so that is simple linear regression. I'm just going to now briefly talk about multivariable linear regression. So we are just extending this now to have, that's all right, uh, to have more than one predictor. Okay, really, the principle is exactly the same. We have, a, just as before, we have a slope associated with our x1, but we have a slope with each additional variable which can be interpreted in exactly the same way. Just be careful, and I think in the last four or five years, people have learned this. Never say multivariate. Always say multivariable. Multivariate literally means multiple y-axis, not multiple variables, okay? So, Always avoid multi, the word multivariate regression or multivariate binary religious regression. Some people will let it slide the same, they may not know. But if you get someone horrible like me reviewing, I'll go, you can't say that. Okay, so just say multivariable modeling. There's very few of you would use multivariate methods. Anyone use confirmatory factor analysis or factor analysis? That's a multivariate method, okay? but most people don't actually ever come across multivariate methods in their whole life. Okay, so what I'm now gonna do is talk about these same steps, but I'm gonna emphasize the new steps, okay? We're not even gonna talk about the same step as before, okay? So as before, we use our software to estimate our model. Nothing new there. We do need to think about model significance because there two aspects of model significance now. There is, is the overall model significant? Does the overall model work? And if the overall model works, which parts are good, which parts work, and which parts don't, okay? So we're now splitting it up. So first we'll consider the significance of the overall model, and only if the overall model is do we consider the significance of the individual predictors themselves? Explanatory power, as before, where we used R squared, we use a slightly different R squared now called adjusted R squared. It is adjusted for the fact that we have multiple predictors. Okay, 
and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, if we talk about the model validity, it's the same as before. Linearity, residuals, independence. That's exactly the same as before. We do have one other issue, and that is multicollinearity. It sounds very technical, but it's a very simple idea. Are our independent variables, our X variables, truly independent of each other, or are they correlated with each other? with each other. Now that's a simple concept. The mechanisms that drive that can be quite complicated, like confounding and mediation, all those things come into it. And finally, uh, and this is also the goodness of the model too, uh, parsimony, I've heard it called parsimony and parsimony. Anyone want to correct me? Is there any English expert in the word, in, in the room? What is the word? Parsimony or parsimony? I don't know. See, I'm just giving you both sign. I've got to be right. Okay, I don't know, I don't know. That's a simple concept. We want the simplest model possible. The simple models are stable. And exactly the same as before, if the model's super duper, we can use it for predictions. Okay, so I really just want to talk about these new issues. Okay, the first I want to talk about is this idea of parsimony. Okay. We do need to consider this. The one thing I will tell you is with a set sample size, let's say we've had 500 patients, the more predictors we have in our model, the less stable that model is. The less likely it is to hold when I move it to another sample, to another sample, to another sample. It loses its generalizability. So simple models are good models, okay? And that is the idea of parsimony. We actually have statistics that tell us about this, if anyone's ever heard of AIC or BIC, Akeke's Information Criteria, the Bayes Information Criteria. These take this into account. Model complexity is a cost, okay? Model fit or lack of fit is a cost, and we want to balance these two things. But generally, just remember Occam's Razor, the simplest answer is often the best. It's certainly the most stable and generalizable. Okay, so just to get this concept across, and this is a bit of a difficult question because it depends on what your setting would be as to what the current is. But let's consider three different models. In the first model, our R squared is 50%. In other words, 50% of the variation in my outcome can be explained by my model, okay? In the second model, I've got three predictors. 97% of variation in my outcome can be explained by the model. And in the third model, I've got five predictors, and that explains 97.5%. Now, remembering the notion of parsimony, which model would you pick? Probably number two. Probably number two. Okay, again, setting is everything. If accuracy is much more important than anything else, maybe we might consider the two variables worth it because they may be routinely measured or, or whatever. But in most settings, that second model would probably be the best. Even though it doesn't fit the data the best. Okay, so multicollinearity is a simple idea. Are my X's correlated? Yes or no? Yes, we would say that they are multicollinear. Okay? It can be a complex issue because there are many mechanisms that drive it and there are many implications of it. I'm going to keep it quite simple and then I'm going to come back to it right at the end. There are a number of reasons. That's all right. A number of reasons we don't want our X variables correlated with each other. First, we want to be able to ascribe variation in our outcomes uniquely to each X. Well, that variation can be explained due to age, that variation can be explained due to gender, that variation can be explained due to smoking history, whatever. We don't want these mashed together, okay? That makes life nice and easy, okay? Uh, and look, just to give you a very silly textbook example, of how this gets mashed together. 
let's consider uh, two variables. We're talking about the vocabulary of young children, how many words are in their language. We measure their age and we measure their shoe size. Any problems there? That's exactly right. In fact, you could argue that it's a surrogate measure almost, okay? I mean, not purely, but they're going to be highly correlated. Now, here, we would use our sense to actually say shoe size, that's a stupid measure. It's obviously age driving it. But in many systems, particularly if you're talking about biomedical studies, we don't have that common sense to actually say, which it is due to. So for example, if you're talking about functional markers and, uh, sorry, a, a marker and a functional genome and a marker gene, they're gonna be highly correlated, but only one of those uh, genes will actually explain variation in something, okay? Now that's the first problem. The second problem is that multi correlated X's, remember it's a big word for correlated X's, leads to unstable estimates of our slopes. Okay, so just to show you a picture of what I mean here, if we have multi in our data set, our confidence intervals would look like that. If we didn't, the confidence intervals would look like that. Now remember, we are trying to show that that is significantly what type of error are we committing here? Type one or type two? I hope you know what I even mean by that. Type one or type two by ignoring multicollinearity. I'll just remind you what I mean. A type one is the false positive, saying that X explains Y when it truly doesn't. The type two is the false negative failing to identify an important factor. Which is it here? If I don't account for multicollinearity, zero is in my own I cannot say that my beta, or sorry, my X variable, sorry, my beta is significantly different from zero. In other words, I cannot say that my X is an important predictor, okay? That's a type two error. Okay, I'm failing to identify an important risk factor as important. Okay. Uh, so how do we get around this? We have this special statistic called the variance inflation factor. It's a simple idea and almost nobody actually understands what that idea is. They just use it. Uh, and that is, and I don't know why they picked a variance inflation factor. They should have square rooted it, by the way. The variance inflation factor is how much wider the variance is than it should be. What would be a better statistic is how many times wider is the standard error than what it should be, because that would tell us how much wider the confidence intervals are than they should be. But what it translates to is a variance inflation factor of four means that our confidence intervals are double what they should do. Take the square root of it, in other words. Okay, if a variance inflation factor was nine, that would mean it's three times wider than what it should be. Do you care? No. Variance inflation factor less than five, it's fine. Okay, that's what most people will use. Some people 10, but I think that's very extreme. Okay, so that is multivariable linear regression. Now I want to briefly, do we want a five minute break? We've got about 20, 25 minutes to go. Can you cope with it? Okay. Um, so now I want to get onto the mo much more useful model of the general linear model, because what we've been talking about is a linear model where we've only got continuous predictors. Okay, we've got a continuous outcome today. That's all we're talking about, continuous outcomes. But what I have been talking about is a model where we have continuous predictors. We want a model that can do both, that has both continuous predictors and categorical predictors. So ANOVA, analysis of variance, was always about categorical predictors. Continuous predictors was always linear regression. Marrying them together, is called the general linear model.
Okay, so think of general linear model as a child where mum is linear regression and dad is then over, they got married and had a child. That's the general linear model. They can do both. Okay. By the way, it's a trick. The guy, and I can't remember who it was, it was Nelda, I think, or someone who came up with the general linear model, scammed us. They scammed us because it is actually not its own method. It's just linear regression that sort of had a paint job, okay? Um, it really doesn't do anything new. By the way, I don't really mean that. It was actually a very good idea at the time. They actually generalized, uh, came up with a unifying theory. But the point I wanna make is if you understand linear regression, by default, you understand the general linear model. It is linear regression. We're just tricking it, okay? So a linear regression used to perform an analysis of variance type analysis, categorical predictive, or even those including both categorical continuous predictors are called a general linear model. A more sensible name, but not very widely used, is normal linear model, okay? But not many people use that name. The reason people do distinguish is there is another model called the generalized linear model that is a different model. Again, it's a further extension. I don't know how it is possibly to confuse between a general linear model and a general linear model. Uh, they sound so similar. So I sort of very much understand that people would get confused between them. So a general linear model is a linear regression, normal outcome. Generalized linear model is extended to other types of outcomes. In fact, binary logistic regression is a generalized linear model. You'll be an expert in two weeks, don't worry. Okay, so let me very quickly uh, review the multivariable linear regression. We have a single outcome, we have a bunch of continuous predictors that relate to the outcome in a linear way, okay? A constant slope. To represent this in a simpler form, we can use matrix algebra, and I'll show you on the next slide what that looks like. And it's a very nice simple matrix, okay? Okay, where y is a column of values for our outcome variable, x is a table that has our uh, predictors in it, and Betas is a vector that relates x to y, and then we've got what's left over, the residual at the end. Okay, so that's it right there. Okay, there's my column for the outcome. Here is each of my predictors as columns. The one is there, the column of ones is there for beta zero, so the intercept. This relates the x to the y, so the slope that corresponds to each column. And what's left over in the end. Now, I'm, I apologize for showing you the matrix algebra, but it actually makes life a lot easier if we think about it in those terms. Okay, now I'm going to give you a model that is wrong. Okay. But I want to get to get across. We are going to consider systolic blood pressure again. Uh, a very boring example, but everyone understands it. Systolic blood pressure in terms of both age and gender. In this incorrect model, we have a variable for age, we have a variable for maleness, and a variable for femaleness. Okay, now M and F are what are called dummy variables or indicator variables, in that M equals one if you and zero otherwise. Female equals one if you're female and zero otherwise. And this is what's called an over-specified or over-parameterized model. What's the problem? <laughs> we only need one variable. That's exactly right. If I am not male, I must be female, or if I am female, I must not be male. I think I said that backwards, but you know what I mean, okay? Um, okay, so that's what I'm assuming. So in other words, M and F are perfectly collinear. And I shouldn't really say collinear. They are not continuous variables. What I should say is that they are perfectly 
inversely concordant. If I am male, I cannot be female. If I am female, I cannot be male, okay? What we could say, if you wanna talk in maths for five seconds, is that the matrix, this X matrix that I showed you before, there it is, is not of full rank. There is redundancy in it that doesn't need to be there. It needs to be trimmed back, okay? The main point, we only need one dummy variable to indicate the two states of gender. Okay, so here is the correct model. Systolic blood pressure equals beta zero plus beta, sorry, I should have the age subscript today. Uh, beta age, age plus beta gender times gender, where gender is zero for males and gender is just one for females. Now, I just want to make a point here that in this case, I am making males the referent. Okay, and I'm not sure if you've come across the statistical definition of a referent. It might be a word you've heard, the reference group, but here, I guess when we can see it in the statistics, it actually makes a lot of sense. So here I've chosen males as the referent or reference group. So this beta gender tells us the difference in systolic blood pressure from males if you are female. So what this really means is beta gender represents a mean difference between these two groups. And this idea of a reference is very, very important, not so much in uh, the normal models, but as soon as we get to things like binary logistic regression, the idea of a reference category is really, really important, okay? So I wanna look at this over-parameterized model and the correct model from the matrix point of view. Here, there's my column of ones or beta zero, my ages. This was my male variable. So these are all males and these are all not females. And these were all not males and these were females. And as you can see, they're perfectly inversely related to each other. So we just dumped this variable here and kept this one. So male, 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 female, female. Okay? Okay, so I'm not even going to run it through software. I'm going to just give you a simple and fictitious example about how we might interpret these things. And you actually see that it's very easy to understand the general linear model from just the values that you're given, rather than getting software to do it for you, really gives you a very strong insight into how these models work. So I'm going to give you B to zero equals 100, and it was significant. Zero. I'm going to give beta age equals 0 0.333, and it was significantly different from zero, and beta gender equals minus 25, and it was significantly different from zero. Let's interpret these three intersections. Sorry, these three uh, coefficients. So the first one, beta zero equals 100. That is the expected systolic blood pressure who is zero years old and has a gender of male and P is less than 0 0.05. So baby male SBP on average is significant different from zero. That's a stupid question. We're not even going to ask it, okay? As before, often the hypothesis test around beta zero is just, it doesn't make any sense. It's not clinically useful. It's a silly question to ask. And it's often not even relevant to the sample. We don't have baby males in this sample. Okay, number two. Now you should be experts at this. This is standard linear regression interpretation. Beta age equals 0 0.333. Age is continuous, suggesting that beta age is a slope. As we age one year on average, our systolic blood pressure should rise by 0 0.333. P is less than 0 0.05, uh, 0 0.05. So we would reject the null hypothesis and conclude that we can say age explains variation systolic blood pressure. That's standard linear regression. Now here's the different one. Beta gender equals negative 25. 
Gender is categorical. So that suggests that beta gender is going to be a mean difference. It's not a slope, it's a mean difference. When gender is one, i.e. female, we expect the SBP to be lower compared to males by 25 units, okay, on average. So in other words, the mean systolic blood pressure for females was 25 units lower than for males. That's a mean difference, okay? Since he was less than verified, we would reject the null hypothesis and conclude that on average female SVP differs from males. That's an N over type hypothesis. Okay, can we go a little bit further with this? Yes, we can. We can also start to think about what the means for these groups are in a much better way than we traditionally have. Now, again, I'm gonna start with the wrong answer because I want to show you how we can build on that. So P was less than 0 0.05. There was a significant difference between males and females in terms of their systolic blood pressure. In other words, beta gender was significantly different from zero. Males are the reference, so beta gender equals negative 25 represents the difference due to being female, okay? So the mean SVP for females was 25 units less. We can use this information to work out estimated marginal means. Now that's a horrible expression. It means model-based means. That's essentially what it means. Using the model, can I estimate the mean? as opposed to just a sample mean, adding them up, dividing by the number they are. So again, this is wrong, but I want to build it. So males, I could argue, were 100, which was the intercept, plus beta gender, which is negative 25, times zero. So that becomes zero, males is 100. For females, it is 75, because it is 100 plus Together, which is negative 25, and their dummy variable was 1. So it's 100 minus 25, that's 75. Okay? That's not right. It's not right yet, but we're moving towards it. Okay? The problem with this is that assumes we're talking about newborn babies again. There is no age in that equation. Okay, so let's do it properly this time. And what we tend to do is put the average age into the model. Okay, so we can work out. So if we assume that the average age is 30, okay, I can put it into the model. And I see it's 100, which is the intercept, plus negative 25 times 0, that's 0, plus 0 0.333 times 30, which is 10. So the mean solid blood pressure for males is 110. For females, it's exactly the same, but it's 100 minus 25 plus 10, so it is 75. Okay, and that's what it looks like graphically. Now here is the important question. That was really complicated to do that. Well, it actually wasn't that complicated, but it was involved, it was a little bit convoluted and so on. Why wouldn't I just go and calculate the sample means? Why wouldn't I just go and get males and get the sample mean for systolic blood pressure, add all the male SVPs up, divide by the number of males, add all the female SVPs, divide by the number of females. What's the advantage of this approach? That, that's certainly one of them, but it's actually not necessarily what I'm getting at. That would be an effect modification issue. And yeah, you are right there, but I think there's a much more important issue there, okay? Okay, let me put it to you this way. Remember I said in randomized control trials, we design things out. Imagine we could randomize gender. That's crazy to even think we could, but imagine we could. We could randomize gender, across ages and so on, make sure that we had equal numbers of uh, the gender mix at each age was exactly the same, okay? That would be fine, okay? In other words, what that means 
is my males have exactly the same age distribution as my females. Okay, that's like living in RCT world, right? The answer is confounding. Let me give you an example. Do I do that on the next page? Yes. Okay, so I'll just I'll get hold off the example for 20 seconds or so. I want to make a very, very important point. I think this is a central point to what I'm talking about in this, these couple of weeks. Adjusting estimates for other covariates is one of the main advantages of multivariable modeling over the more naive methods like t-tests, chi-squares, and so on. Okay, so I just want to get this confounding point across here. Let's say our study is observational, which it is, and we know that on average our females are older than our males. Okay, our females on average are older than our males. Any difference we see between males and females is going to be, could potentially be due to two things. One, the gender effect but also the age effect, because our females are older. We want to be able to separate these two things out. We want the pure gender difference, okay? We don't want the gender difference confounded with something else. And that's what this actually does. By using model-based means, we can statistically control for other effects. Sample means don't allow us to do that. So sample means we live in a bivariate universe. With model-based means, we can adjust out. We can statistically control for confounders. And that is a major advantage of them. Okay, so in red flashing writing there, okay, I want you to understand that point. That estimated much all means, model-based means, adjust or allow for the adjustment of confounders in the model and sample means might actually be very misleading. Okay, so just finally, we're nearly there. Um, I just wanted to bring it home now. We're not gonna talk about bias stats anymore. I just wanna talk about the roles, the various roles of, con of covariates, other predictors, okay? Remember in observational studies, we don't just have one predictor. We may have only one predictor of interest, but we have a bunch of other covariates, okay? Now, the impact these other covariates can have, there's several of them. There's three main impacts that we consider in epidemiology. If you're in the psych world, they're a little bit more subtle about it. They call them different names and they have different mechanisms. But really, just to keep it simple, in epidemiology, we have three main roles that a predictor can have. One, it can be an independent risk factor, okay? So for example, age and gender, you wouldn't expect to be correlated with each other. Uh, they may or may not be confounded, but let's assume they're not. Age explains systolic blood pressure and gender is also a risk factor for, for high systolic blood pressure, independently of age, okay? So different things are risk factors and they may not be correlated with each other. So we would call them independent risk factors, risk factors that are independent of each other, okay? They're not the problem ones. They're quite easy to deal with. The one that seems to cause the most problems with people are confounders, okay? And we, we've just touched on the surface of this and I'll talk much more about it in the next session. But a confounder, uh, is uh, something that happens in observational studies all the time. And this is why we love RCTs, because RCTs by randomization balance confounders. We don't have to worry about them anymore. And the third is effect modification, which we just talked about a minute ago. Okay, so I'm just gonna talk about these brief things and then, then we're finished. Okay, so particularly at first glance, the roles uh, of these covariates seem to be, of these types of covariates, seems to be quite subtle, that if you think about it in a lot of detail, uh, it, it makes a lot of sense. One thing I do want to mention is, is again, particularly in psych research, they separate out, they talk about confounders being different from mediators, being different from colliders and surrogates, 
and so on. The reason I'm not going to differentiate them is because how we model them is exactly the same. How we interpret them from the model actually differs. So for example, a confounder and a mediator are very similar, except that a mediator is on the causal pathway, a confounder is not. I'm going to leave that there. I don't even want to open that can of worms, okay? But if anyone does want to talk about that subtle difference, uh, that's it. But when it comes to modeling, how I would adjust for a mediator or a confounder is exactly the same, okay? It gets complicated. Okay, so confounding, such an important issue in operational studies. The definition of a confounder is a third variable, often one we're not particularly interested in, that associates with both the outcome variable and the predictor of interest, the study effect, for example. Okay, so the easiest way of thinking of a confounder is an alternative explanation. Did males and females appear to have different systolic probe pressure just because they were of different ages? Okay, was it the age or was it the gender effect? that was responsible for differences between males and females, okay? That would be a notion of a confounder. It's an alternative explanation. The statistical definition of a confounder, say in a linear regression context, is one that changes the beta of our study effect when we add it or remove it from the model, okay? So if I add a new variable and the old beta one stays exactly the same, it's not a confounder. Okay, it's just an independent risk factor or potential independent risk factor. But when I add something to the variable, it changes the effect of my study effect, then that's a confounding effect. Okay, if we do not adjust, and by the way, out of those two models, the model with the confounder in it is the appropriate model. If we do not adjust it for confounders, we will over or underestimate the effect size, the impact of our study effect on our outcome. Okay, and that's bad. Saying something's more important than what it is or less important than what it is just because we didn't adjust for a third variable, that's, that's a bad thing to do. Okay, and I would have to say just having worked in observational studies a majority of the time, this is what I do most of the time, that confounding bias is almost a defining feature of observational studies. Almost all observational studies contain confounding bias, almost all of them. It's a very important concept that you have to be aware of and develop strategies to deal with. And that's, I suspect, why you might actually be um, at this lecture, whether you know it or not, I suppose, because I think that's the most important thing that we're getting out of it. So let me just uh, point something out here. I want you to unlearn something that you may have been taught, again, from the dark days of your undergraduate. Some people have been taught that in order to include something in the model, it must be statistically significant. Who's been told that? You have. Yeah, and by the way, I, I was too. I was as well. Uh, that I was told, I remember my undergraduate, if you want to include something in the model, you must justify it through its statistical significance. If P is not less than 0 0.05, throw it out. Anyone ever use stepwise methods? That's how they work. Stepwise is a terrible method because it doesn't really take confounding into account. Okay? It will leave confounder, important confounders out because they're not statistically significant. Okay, so I want you to unlearn that, that if something alters your study effect by a lot, that alone is a justification for putting it in the model, particularly in a hypothesis testing study, because otherwise I would be overestimating or underestimating the importance of my risk factor. And that is a much bigger crime as far as I'm concerned. Okay, so let me give you two more. Yeah. Okay, so solid blood pressure, we find that male effect is huge. Okay, you do not want to be a male here because their solid blood pressure is 40 units high. Okay, that's our first model. Our second model is male increases still statistically 
a little less, there's still some significant community above 20. But if we accounted for them being a smoker, and by the way, so I should give you the context of this example. I've worked a lot with the Thais, okay, in uh, with, with Thai diabetes patients in particular. And in Thailand, if you smoke, you are male, basically. I would say something like nine, above 99% of smokers are male in that country. So smoking is very highly associated with gender, okay? So here, I should have said that first, we found that the male effect was highly significant. The problem is, is only males can smoke. Not, it, it's not, it's extremely rare for females to smoke. It's not unheard of, but it generally doesn't happen. So basically, the fact is, is this is male and smoking, or many of these males are also smoking. If we account for wedding work, the effect of the main comes down. Now, I want to know from you, giving your opinion, if I only presented that top model, right, in, in my paper, am I doing something wrong? Yes, I am overestimating the riskiness of being male. Not that there's any intervention you can do about that. I suppose you can educate them more and so on. Um, yeah, sorry, of course, there's things you can do. But the point is, is I'm very much misrepresented. Now, in that second model, remember what we learned about the regression. Oh, that's not statistically significant. So my stepwise regression says, that's your best model. That's your best model, present that. Okay, that's what stepwise is. But this is the best model. I'm not making a comment on whether smoking is a significant uh, that what I do want is an accurate estimate of the gender on society. Okay, so there's your unlearning uh, aspect. Okay, so which gender effect would I present? The second one. Sorry, we're nearly there. Oh God, I've run out of time in the end. Okay, I'm gonna be really, really, really quick with this. The last thing I wanted to talk about was effect modification. And we did mention this briefly before. The idea of effect modification is the riskiness of our study effect will change with the level of another variable. And I do emphasize this much more in the next lecture. So in other words, we might talk about here, how gender might modify the effect of age on SVP. In other words, if you look at this graph here, age is much riskier for males than it is for females, okay? Because we can see a much sharper growth in SVP among males than we can females. And we might actually find it's significant impact for males, but not for females, okay? So, Really, I've, I've already explained that. So how can we represent and test for effect modification? This notion that, uh, that there's a modification going on. Okay. Um, in a statistical model from modeling framework, we call this an interaction effect. I'm going to skip past this because I'm talking more about the statistics. What I really want to do is very quickly show you what it looks like in the model. So here, we have age, as we did before. We have gender, as we did before. But by adding a multiplicative term, age times gender, and a special coefficient for that. And we are going to test that against zero because that will tell us whether there's a statistical interaction. Okay? Now, what I really want you to get, and I, I'm feeling bad because I've run out of time, because I do find the penny drops for a lot of people here in this particular slide and the next slide. For two reasons. One, the idea of a reference. We can plug in our values and we find that that term's going to disappear, that term's going to disappear, so we get the reference model. In this case, it's the blue model. There it is. The blue model is the latter, it's the reference model. For females, we will put in our dummy variable one. And after we get a little bit of rearrangement, 
we get some blood pressure is the original insect plus a generator. And the slope is the original age slope that was in the rectal group plus a general effect times age. So this is the difference in the model. This is the difference in intercept due to being thinner. This is the difference in age slope due to being thinner. So given that, and I'm, I'm sorry that I've had to hurry you here, I want you to tell me, let's concentrate on this first one. I want you to tell me whether this value is positive or negative. The intercept. Is the intercept beta gender on the intercept positive or negative? Remember, blue is the reference. Positive. So the intercept for females is high. So that is beta zero, and this is beta zero plus beta two. Okay? What about the slope? So there's the slope for males. Here is the slope for females. So specifically when it comes to this, is that positive or negative? Is the slope sharper for females or more shallow for females? It's shallower, meaning it will be negative. So the slope was here, we subtract a little bit from it, and it comes down. Okay? I'm assuming positive slopes here. Okay, and again, what I want to emphasize is that you can get these values from your table that the software split spits out and actually interpret their meaning. I can see that females had a higher intercept, but a lower slope than males. Okay, they started out worse, but they actually got better over time, over age, I should say. Okay, so sorry, I, I really did have to speed through that. Okay, so what did I miss? And I very uh, briefly did talk about this. I did miss talking about model selection. I've given you very simple toy examples where we've had two predictors, but in observational studies, we'll have 30 or 40 or 50 potential predictors for a model. How do we decide what are the important ones? Particularly given that they can be independent risk factors, confounders, effect modification, modifiers. How do we actually get around that problem? And it's not something I'm actually talking about this uh, in this particular workshop today. I might talk a little bit more about it in a couple of weeks. It really should be a topic by itself because it's got nothing to do with the statistical model you're using, okay? Uh, but today, I just forced them into the model, okay? And my favourite approach is purposeful selection of covariates, and the approach I never use is stepwise. It's evil, okay? It just, it just can't do certain things. Okay, so, and really sorry for running over time. At first glance, okay, uh, these guys do actually get a copy of these lecture notes. I think you can get a copy of them. Could I ask you to do me a favor? Look through those last couple of slides I had to skip past quite quickly, particularly the one showing you the referent model and the model that was for females. Just have a look at it, spend two minutes on it. It will really greatly benefit you in the future because the penny does drop and you go, wow, that actually makes sense. And seeing by statistical models makes sense, makes sense, okay? So at first glance, uh, these linear models look a little bit young, but they're not really. Um, it's often, I find, due to different ways that different people learn. If you come from very much a content-based area, so you learned a lot more content-based, like book learned type of stuff, you might be used to learning things in that way. Statistics is not so much content-based, there's a little bit of content there. It's more process-based. You've got to learn it by using it and thinking about it back here, even when you're not aware you're thinking about it, okay? So it's really using it. And that's why I said right at the start, clinical researchers who have done 50, 60, 70, 80 studies are often very good methodologists, even though they may not be formally trained in the area because very slowly it's bubbled away in the background. <laughs> 
um, okay. But just also remember when you are suffering that you are not alone and just consult your local friendly uh, fire statisticians to get some help. Alison, not me. No, you can either of us, okay? Um, and thank you. Any questions? Don't I get a clap? Come on. <laughs> Any questions at all? Yep. And then there's three different methods for doing it as well, isn't there? Yeah. yeah. So you always come across the kind of handy, handy disaster, you know, like a quality ocean, and then you have to improve it. It is a very tricky issue because it, it is this butting heads a lot of the time against maybe what might be the best idea is to come up with our own that very much fit our clinical population a lot better, but then you've got to actually sell it to people who use these standard approaches and who can say, well, these are pretty robust methods. And you've got people who have preferences in one area and then the other. So I'm not actually sure how good, I can never remember the names uh, of the three. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, for, for a start, the first thing I would ask is, is EGFR in this case going to be your outcome or is it a predictor? Okay. Uh, mm. Well, in a clinical trial, it shouldn't matter because you would hope that you've got balance. But even if randomization failed or it's a non-randomized trial or something like that, I don't think it ever hurts to put predictors in, even if it's to rule them out, okay? So that's probably what I would do if it was non-randomized or a cohort study or something like that, okay? Because I don't think it's good enough. And I think you might agree that you've got doubts about this one size fits all. Uh, and that you really want to investigate whether that's true or not, even if it's just to rule it out as a problem. So my feeling is, is I would put it in. You may not even report it, particularly if it's got no effect, you might just mention in your methods that you confirmed that there was no additional variation due to age and gender and so on. Yeah, that's right. But it's almost a little bit of a different issue, isn't it? Because what you're saying is how we measure something depends on our age and gender, as opposed to is age and gender a risk factor for, that's right. So, so those are two different things too? Yeah, yeah. It's a complicated question. It's a, by the way, it's a very interesting question. My feeling is, is if in doubt, it never hurts to just have a look. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? <laughs> 